Hi, this is Terry. Uh, we're going to do Chapter 5 now in financial accounting. Uh, it tends to be a very long chapter, so I'm going to go quickly through all of our information here. Flip my button on. The first issue here then becomes with inventory, are we working under a periodic or a perpetual system? Periodic or perpetual? The difference here is a perpetual system would be what you would use for uh, a business that has high, t high dollar items, high ticket items, but doesn't sell very many. So that would be, you know, somebody that's selling fur coats or selling yachts, those kind of items. And the difference is that their inventory will always be correct, hence the word perpetual. A periodic system then is typically a um, company who s sells items that are lower volume or lower uh, cost but just very high volume. Uh, therefore, since their inventory is only updated once a month when you do the financial statements, then your inventory is only accurate that once a month. The next item here is internal controls and there's a whole uh, set that we're going to talk about later so we'll wait uh, wait a, m a few minutes until we hit that section internal controls are important for maintaining the accuracy of our documents records you know, numbers etc terms of sale um, we can when we sell an item we can we know that we can give people a sales discount uh, on the uh, flip side of that is a purchase discount. So what we can do is sell them an item and say that it's 210 net 30. And the issue there becomes that they get a 2% discount if they pay within 10 days of the invoice date. Otherwise, the net value is due within 30 days. So if we would record um, a sales, let's, let's record that we have accounts receivable. Now let's just pick some easy numbers of a thousand dollars and that we have sales of a thousand then when somebody pays us if we give them a two percent discount or twenty dollars then we're going to show that we receive cash of nine thousand hundred and eighty dollars we're going to show that accounts receivable is going to come off for a thousand we know that debits have to equal credits so we have a twenty dollar sales discount and the reason that we want to record our information this way and not just back off our sales we could just debit sales the issue becomes then we would lose how much of a discount that we're giving so the sales discount is a, a contra account we would do the same thing with our purchases so I'll move my little slide bar here and we would show that we would have purchases and let's say a thousand dollars in accounts payable of a thousand dollars then later uh, if we are given two percent discount and we take advantage of it then we would record that our accounts payable of a thousand dollars is going to come off we're going to pay out cash nine hundred and eighty and therefore we have a purchase discount of twenty Again, why do we keep those co uh, contra accounts so that we have access to that information and know what uh, purchases that you know what our true value is, w uh, what purchase discounts are we taking advantage of, or on the flip side, what sales discounts are other people taking advantage of? FOB destination then becomes. Uh, easier to draw kind of a little picture that if we have a little truck going down the road and there's our 16 wheeler and it starts here at company A goes down the road and it's going to go to company B at what point does the ownership be, um, exchange hand for the inventory so if that uh, truck fell off the side of a mountain and crashed whose inventory would it be and if the terms of the sale were FOB shipping point, it's at this point that the truck leaves the uh, leaves company A that the transfer of ownership has gone to company B. So if it's FOB shipping point, then at that point, 
there we go, at that point, ownership has changed. If it's FOB destination, then company A owns that merchandise until it backs up to company B. Um, and it's it's just the terms of whatever you agree to in the sale of the of your merchandise. You you set those uh, uh, FOB shipping point and destination at that point. All right. The next item here then is how do we record the purchasing or the buying of merchandise under a perpetual system? and the issue becomes that we're not going to have purchases that we're actually going to have merchandise inventory so that merchandise because this is perpetual it's high high uh, dollar uh, low volume items then our merchandise inventory will always be accurate we would put all of our money directly into the merchandise we we do not use the purchase account then if we return some merchandise then we simply back it out of the merchandise inventory and then later when we pay off our accounts payable then we would look at the balance the issue or the focus here though is on the fact that when we buy the merchandise inventory it goes directly in when we return merchandise inventory it comes directly out that's why it's always perpetual if we are going to sell inventory then under a perpetual system we have to make two journal entries the first journal entry is to record and these are on the wrong line that needs to go up one and this needs to go up one the first issue is that the cost of goods sold and our inventory is directly going to come out um, at the same point in time then we're going to record the accounts receivable and the sales at the markup value so at this point we're taking our inventory which is an asset and since we're giving that up it now becomes an expense because the cost of goods sold is an expense account again at the same point in time that we record that we gave up the inventory under a perpetual system you have to have two journal entries and therefore you've got to record the accounts receivable and the sales under this system then uh, if we people return merchandise to us then we have to reverse our inventory and our cost of goods sold so we need to debit our inventory credit our cost of goods sold and also back off the accounts receivable notice though instead of just reversing the sales that we use sales returns and allowances like we discussed up above we don't want to lose that number because if we that uh, dollar amount in that account becomes too high more than normal that becomes a signal to management that they've got some kind of problems maybe uh, the catalog had um, wrong numbers that were published so people keep ordering merchandise but uh, the company keeps sending sending the wrong merchandise because the numbers are messed up or or whatever the case may be all right if we move on down then we're going to go to a periodic system and again a periodic system is high volume low dollar therefore we have to calculate the cost of goods sold and we are going to be very involved with this section and it's quite complicated so let me get rid of the red marks and we'll kind of go step by step the first item here is, is net sales. That's going to be your gross sales minus discounts minus returns and allowances. But for the sake of us wanting to focus in on the cost of goods sold, I just didn't include all that extra. Then we know our beginning inventory. Our beginning inventory is going to be last period's ending inventory. Or if it's a brand new company, of course that dollar amount in there will be zero. Get my zero written in there then we have all of our purchases so all of our purchases will know because we'll have all those invoices we subtract out anything that we returned and that gives us our net purchases then we have to add in the cost of freight which freight in adds to the cost of our purchases it's, it's just another expense that we incur because we were purchasing uh, it's the cost of getting those materials to us so 
get rid of that message that may or may not have popped up on your screen, sorry. Um, that gives us our net cost of purchases. So all of these together give us, gives us our net cost of purchases. So beginning inventory plus our net purchases is goods available for sale. And that goods available for sale is a major concept because that's everything that you could possibly sell. Then what we do is we go out and take a physical count in the warehouse to see what's our ending inventory, merchandise inventory, at the end of our accounting period. And at that point, of everything that was possible to sell, if we subtract out what's left, then the rest of it must have been sold and or stolen. And we include theft in as a period cost. So by definition, the cost of goods sold is everything that's no longer there. Then sales minus cost of goods sold is gross margin. We subtract out our operating expenses. We get net income before taxes. Minus taxes is net income. This whole concept here is absolutely critical. Go through it as many times as you need to to understand it you will need this the concept for any finance class, any marketing class, any um, biz, you know, business classes, accounting classes. It's just such a major concept. Please go through it slowly so, and make sure that you understand how to make the cost of goods sold calculation. To journalize then all of the, the uh, accounts so that it fits into that framework then we're going to again we're going to look at a periodic system and we're going to buy notice that we're going to use purchases under a perpetual system we debited merchandise inventory under a periodic system we calculate purchases uh, or we debit purchases and then we calculate the cost of goods sold so we have purchases, then if we return some merchandise, we have purchase returns and allowances, and then we add in our freight in. The accounts payable is just to pay off the balance. When we sell, that's to buy, so when we sell merchandise inventory, then notice that there's only one journal entry. We do not do like we did in the perpetual, we debited accounts receivable and sales, but then we also debited cost of goods sold and merchandise inventory. Again, we don't have that second journal entry when we're under a periodic system. Then we have our sales returns, which we've discussed before, and then pay the outstanding balance. The next major area then is about internal controls and in inter internal controls um, subdivide in many different areas. It's a very important concept of business. And one, the, the first one your book talks about is the control environment, that have you set up an, an ethical uh, situation? Do, you know, do your employees see other people stealing and your bosses know about it and so nobody does anything about it? Well, all of those issues come into uh, come into play when you're talking about internal control and safeguarding your assets and making sure that people aren't stealing and that the numbers that you record on your financial statements are correct. There's also the concept of risk assessment that you need to look at high risk areas and put in stronger internal controls. So uh, the loading dock is, is classically one of the high risk areas that how do you know whether people are loading into a truck or just throwing it into the trunk of their car. So one of the issues is you would make sure that none of the employees could park anywhere near where the truck loads and unloads merchandise. Um, Information and communication is, is have you properly trained your employees? Have you set the responsibilities and, and the big issue there is accountability. So if you've trained your employees and they know what to do, you have a better chance of them doing it correctly. If they haven't been trained, then of course you're going to run into problems. To do that, then you set up policies and procedures. You let people know, not only have you trained them, but there is a preset procedure on how to handle such things as checking in inventory and who's supposed to do it. 
and then management needs to do periodic reviews. They can't watch every minute, uh, every person for every minute, but they certainly can go through and periodically just see what's going on, look for high peak uh, areas that are that you know that are high risk, those kind of issues. I just want to touch on a couple of the control activities and um, some of the, some of the major ones. And physical controls is one of the important ones that you can just physically lock doors, limit who has keys, um, make sure that um, you know the alarms are set, those kind of issues, and those become the physical controls. Another big one then becomes separation of duties. And the, the big issue there is whoever has control of the assets, control of the assets, doesn't have the um, authorization of the assets. So, for instance, if you have a petty cash fund, the person that physically has control or has that $100 cash box would not be the same person that comes in and counts it to make sure that the cash is all there. Well, if, if you're one and the same, which happens in, in small businesses, of course, you know, that money can come up missing and nobody would know it. So the person who would authorize the distribution of those assets is not the same person that has physical, physical control of those assets. Um, therefore, it takes at least two people to circumvent the internal controls, and that's called collusion. And remember that all internal controls have the inherent risk because we're humans. Humans make mistakes. They get tired. Uh, they don't remember those kind of issues. So it's very important to do everything that you can to safeguard your assets. The next section here, or the last section here, is the flow of documentation. And I'd like to go through it and kind of draw it on the screen here. The idea is you would make a purchase requisition. So each department would decide what it is that they need for the upcoming month, whatever, uh, whatever period of time. And somebody takes all those requisitions and puts them together and makes a purchase order or your book calls it a purchase re request. That documentation then is sent from the buyer from the buyer to the seller and the seller then is going to create an invoice of the products that they're, they're going to sell you. With that invoice they're going to uh, create a picking slip that tells you what to pull from inventory and load on the trucks then you get a packing slip and a packing slip is different because you may be out of something physically out of something the computer may tell you that it's there but when you go out in the warehouse it may not be there um, it may be you know damaged and just has not been updated in the records so the picking slip is about what you should be able to send the packing slip is what you're actually sending then that's sent on a, a truck to the the buyer's destination and what they're going to do is they're going to make a receiving report because things tend to fall off the truck and so just because it was sent over from the seller doesn't mean that the buyer received it because um, and, and again that's what a receiving report does once the receiving report um, is is there then somebody's going to do a check authorization when they do they're going to make sure that what was purchased was what was received and that there's nothing more or whoops nothing more or nothing less did it come back I hate to move it so I don't uh, mess up here um, so the uh, the packing slip and the purchase order are combined together to make sure that um, that nothing extra is there and once once somebody's done that verification then a check can be written alright sorry for that little mess up there towards the end and let's get us back to the right spot here and last but not least then is for you to go through the review problem at the end of the chapter because all the periodic petrol um, journal entries are there they're all listed together so you can compare one against the next 
All right, hope this is helpful.